have the Ayatollah of Fantasy Rock and Roller with us today, Adam Rank. How are you doing, Rank? Um, it looked great in person, and I uh, just can't wait to next year where we can pack it full of 25000 How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. I didn't know it was Ball Guy's day. It was being ranked. I mean, how do you lose? This is the Dynasty Vipers Vipercast. Welcome to Behind the Grind, presented by the Fantasy Points Media Group. As always, I am joined by Tara Roberts, and this week's guest, you may recognize her from her time on the NFL Network on NFL Total Access. Now you can catch her on DirecTV, Series XM Radio, but this week, all roads are heading towards the Behind the Grind podcast. Yes, I have no problems making a pun here and there. The one and only Lindsay Rhodes is joining us. How are you doing, Lindsay? Hi guys. I need to hear about this uh this mustache and what the story is behind it because I assume that there is a story behind it, right? Uh no, not really. The mustache I just, just kind of let grow there and hey, this is where it's at. I figured every every fantasy analyst, every member of the media kind of needs that niche, that little that mm. that signature look. There you and go. I can't grow hair as you can see, so this is the next <laughs> best thing going on here for me. To so prove like what, you can grow hair. It's just in a different region. You know what? It, it's like noggin. Kansas here. A little dust, you know, the, the wind kicks mm -hmm. in and all of a sudden the hair starts flying. I mean, my hair basically turns into dust in the wind because it's so thin. So we just kind of, I let it go and I kind of, I have to compete with my old man because he's got the mustache, but it kind of curls up. So I figured, you mm. know, I'll grow one just as big, but I'll have it going down. There you go. I like it. <laughs> it's like a family so, thing. So in the behind the grind here, we're going to kind of get a little bit of a look into your journey through the media here. The rising of Lindsay Rhodes from the humble beginnings of Yakima, Washington to <laughs> where you are at now. So we're going to kind of touch base on all of this. But first, we have to hit you with these hard hitting questions. If you're oh. coming into a baseball game, I don't know, maybe you're maybe you're with the Angels, maybe you're with the Dodgers, maybe, <laughs> hey, maybe you're one of those few people that likes both teams for some hey! reason, which, by the way, <laughs> we me. may have to talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> what it's is totally that fine. Uh, I don't know. I, I know it drives Fabs nuts, having two oh, I know. Fabs hates baseball it. teams. You're not allowed to have two teams. One's in the AL, one's in the NL, whatever. We don't need to get into it. I support Los <laughs> Angeles, period. Uh, the Angels are my team, if... If they both play each other, I root for the Angels. Did you ask me about like my walk-up song? Yeah, I'm going to get there. Like, that, What's that music going to be? <laughs> Cue up Lindsay Rhodes as she Ugh. takes the mound in the ninth inning. So what's funny about this, I've literally never thought about this, and I need to thank you for posing the question, but this is such a constant conversation that we have in my house because my son plays baseball, and uh, I – do the the walk-up songs or i did at one point in the season before i turned into the scorekeeper um so i like was in charge of compiling all of them and then getting this app and i've so i know all of their walk-up songs and we talk on a weekly basis about him changing his walk-up song like it's just every time they listen to music he's like i would like this to be my walk-up song now like our whole life revolves around that so, um, but I really like the one that he picked to start the season that I pushed on him. And then he tried to change it about three different times. And my friend who now does the walk-up music, we just didn't change it. We were like, nope, the first one's the best. And that's the one from the Apple commercial they played during the Super Bowl where the kid's like riding on his bike and he's like, I look real good today. I look real good today. <laughs> no one's ever heard this song before. We heard it. Uh, I, I think it was during the Super Bowl for the first time. And I was like, that song is bomb. And it's so random and it's funny. So um, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to steal my son's walk up song at the moment. Nice. Yeah, I'm good with that. What's that one guilty pleasure song that may be on your iPod right now? What's that one song that, oh man, Lindsay, really? That's on there? Um, the one that it's, I wouldn't say it's like a guilty pleasure that I listen to all the time. What is the name of it? Where's my phone? It's literally played like four times today. Um, I, I like like eighties, uh, 
the songs that like really get me going are like 80s ballads or 80s or 90s things like that. Like it's stuff that when you what is the name of that song that's going to drive me crazy, by the way? Um well, what are you thinking about that here? I know I was catching one of the shows there. I can't remember if it was around your birthday or around New Year's Eve, but I think you were just heading to an actual 80s party and you're yep. kind of getting yourself, you're all dolled up, you're doing the show in your 80s get up. So I got to ask you here, while we're talking about 80s music and this and that, hey, this is fantasy football. We love to rank things. We That's what we do. We rank things. So I need to know, what is Lindsay Rhodes' top five 80s songs? Top five 80s songs. Um, God, I'm not, I'm so bad at this stuff. I feel like I'm failing your podcast. I don't know my top five 80s songs. Um, I like, I'm going to a Def Leppard concert in a August and I like Def Leppard. Um, like poison would be in that, uh, you know, that mix as well. Um, I was Debbie Gibson. If you play anything by Debbie Gibson, I'm in. Okay. Um, that is another one where like, if it pops up, I will start, um, dancing and singing and embarrassing myself in public. But for the most part, it's like, it's stuff like that. That's nostalgic, you know, like it, I feel like music back then has like, it's a different, it's more fun. And that's not to say that I sit around listening to eighties music all the time. I do not at all. Like I have a very eclectic, uh, group of you know I, I taste in music but um but 80s songs are like the ones i think regardless of where whenever you grew up that's the one that you're like oh this song is on and you get stupid you know you don't get stupid about songs that are like current that doesn't happen yeah i feel you on that <laughs> we i did, I, I, I stopped listing i am I, I told you i'm not good at this <laughs> like i'm bad at favorites <laughs> I need to get better at favorites. I need to get better at like knowing like, what's your favorite? We had a friend over last week and he was like top five shows of all time. And I was like, oh, I'm paralyzed for the rest of the night. This is all I have to think about. Cause then I'll be like, okay, this, no, wait, that one is better than that one for the rest of the night. I, they lost me. Yeah. Well, you want to give the right answer. You know, you right. don't want to like, yeah. so you want to think hard about it. I get Kara, you're, you're talking to like a, a, a recovering perfectionist. And so I'm like, I can't say it if it's not the right answer, right? Like some people yeah. are like, no one cares. I'll just give an answer, you know? And I'm like, but it's not, it's not my favorite. I don't feel comfortable saying that. And I like take it way too seriously and ruin the whole fun of it. <laughs> well, I was just about to ask you about some of your favorite players from your favorite teams. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you could do that. You could do that. I've put some thought into that. Uh, I And at least to the point where I feel comfortable answering it, even if it's not totally accurate. Like, yeah. like favorite players that I've covered or favorite, what, what specifically are you looking for here? Oh, yeah. Uh, typically we do uh, favorite players um, of you like growing up, but actually favorite players that you've covered is actually a good one, too. So I tend to like like Dave Roberts is one of my favorite players that I ever covered. Um, the Dodgers manager when he played with the Dodgers, I remember him uh, the day that they traded him. It, he was so devastated and he came out of the clubhouse, nobody ever does this, and found all of the members of the media and thanked us for everything. And we were like, uh, he was one of those guys at the time, the team had some people on the team that were not particularly nice to those of us in the media and would not talk, Kevin Brown um, and a few others. And so, you know, th they, they would not address the media. And so there were a handful of players that it fell on them every night and baseball is such a grind, right? So like Paul LaDuca is the catcher. You could always go to him because the catcher is always catching the pitcher. So if the pitcher won't talk, then the catcher knows everything that happened in the game. And so Paul LaDuca and Dave Roberts were like the two people that answered all the questions all the time. And Dave was just like, he's, he's a normal person, you know? And it's so, it's so fun when you, as a member of the media, you're covering people and there's such a status difference, right? Like you're like, you're constantly asking them for something. And so it creates this tier, uh, where like you're beneath them and some of them start treating you that way. And so the ones who do not treat you that way, it just jumps out at you as like as something that's such a valuable character trait. And so um, I, I always talk about the players um, that are like that, 
the the people the people that I have you know have come through NFL Network that go out of their way to be nice to people they don't have to go out of their way to be nice to. Um, those are always the people that impress me the most. I loved Aaron Jones, like it, you know, not like my favorite player of all time, but when he came through, um, he he was like, I started talking to him, and he's like, "Oh, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Rhodes, thank you," and he was just like such a polite you know, person. I was like, please don't ever call me that again. Cause I feel like I'm 80 years old, but, um, there, you know, I, I, I love some of the people like that. So I got to know this because we mentioned NFL network here. We know run rich runs kind of a thing, but I was going back in the archives oh, yeah. here and I see run roads run. And I need to know, have you been able to improve on that 7.1040 nope. nope. times? Thank you for bringing that up, Matt. Uh, no, no, I have not improved on that. Uh, there, there's not a whole lot of athleticism taking place here, uh, in this body. So I'm hoping that my son, uh, got all of his genetics and daughter from my husband. Um, cause while I know a lot about sports, uh, like actually playing them well was never really my thing. So no, I am not a good runner. Uh, no one ever taught me how to run, right? Like I never like was coached on how to run and so I look like a moron doing it, but I decided those few times that I had to run on camera to like really lean into that. Uh, there were times when I was like, I, I want to wear my heels when I run just so when I look stupid, I have a built in excuse to look stupid. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then we decided that, no, that would actually be um, very dangerous <laughs> on the I concrete. Should out, though, <laughs> I should point out, though, that was an improvement from the year before. So there was progress going on there. That that <laughs> yeah i love all the, the people who are like very condescendingly like that was good i'm like oh no no you're supposed to just like i'm in on the joke i realize how stupid i look let's just go with that <laughs> i mean i don't know if i could get under seven these days myself personally right i'm oh. getting a little bit older there i don't i don't, I don't so move like i used to so bad <laughs> Uh, at least you tried. I don't know if I would be able to try. <laughs> yes, you would. You'd crush my seven. Whatever. And I like did. I like was trying. That's the sad part. I mean, I was in work clothes, so I wasn't like, you know, trying, trying. I didn't train for it. But like that was me trying to run as fast as I could in that moment. <laughs> and that's awful. <laughs> yes. So kind of, so kind of diving into, um, kind of diving into your personal journey now. Um, tell us about a decision that changed the trajectory of your life. Um, easily the biggest decision that I ever made, I was at Fox sports West for, I think I was six years under contract there covering the Los Angeles teams in a bunch of different ways. And there was a point where, uh, NBC offered me an opportunity to go to Beijing to cover the Olympics for them. And I wanted to do it as a freelancer and then come back to my job at Fox. That was, you know, in a perfect world, you don't want to leave your full-time job in order to do that. And Fox had a rule at the time that they wouldn't let, they wouldn't like loan people out. And so they said, you can't do it. And I was like, okay, then I'm leaving um, because this is a really good opportunity for me. I'm at a point in my life where I feel like I need to challenge myself in that way. And this is calling me right here. I want this Olympic experience. This is massive for me. And so I kind of took a chance and left a full-time job in order to become a freelancer with that job lined up and no other jobs and just sort of um, cross my fingers that there would be work that would follow. And that specific experience was the best work experience that I had in my whole life. And it was definitely a game changer for me. I felt like, um, you know, the, the people that I was working with that I felt like uh, this person's my colleague now, uh, it was just like kind of mind blowing to me because I'm such a broadcast nerd. So everyone who had been operating on a national level from a broadcasting standpoint, I couldn't believe that I got to be teammates with them. And so I learned so much. It was a huge growth experience for me um, personally, professionally kind of pushed, pushed my boundaries. And then when I came back, I did start, you know, uh, getting some freelance opportunities and uh, that took me in a bunch of new directions and ultimately to NFL network. And then I was there for 12 years. So I would say that that's, that was the biggest kind of like gamble that I took on myself. But at the time it didn't even feel like a gamble because it was so clear to me that that is exactly where I needed to go, which is the only reason that I felt 
so comfortable just saying like, okay, then that's that. And, you know, I hope it all works out. So sticking with this journey here, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen you see now compared to when you first started, maybe more particular in yourself? Mm, that's a good question. M- m- uh, <laughs> so many things, it doesn't even know, I don't even know where to start. Um, I feel like when I got into the business, I felt very, I was coming at it from a place of defensiveness. And I think that that had to do with being a female in the industry. And there were so few of us. I felt like I had to prove myself every second of every day that everyone was looking at me and waiting for me to not be um, like good enough or credible enough that they, you know, were waiting for me to trip up. And I think that that is in some ways true still for females in terms of knowledge of the sport, but I think it's becoming less and less. So at the time I felt like I had to prove all the time that I was not there to date the players, but I was there because I really loved the sport that I was covering. Um, and that I knew what these sports were because I felt like, you know, especially with football, it was obvious, particularly at the time that I had not played football. And so I had to really, push for the label of credible. And um, I think that it it put me in a very defensive posture uh, that I think uh, I'm a little bit jealous of women that are coming into the industry now that don't have to be that way specifically, because I kind of had to have like my guard up at all times, you know, like you don't necessarily get to know me as a person because I am here not to make friends. I'm here not to uh, date you. I am not, you know what I mean? Like, so you kind of have walls up all the time. And so I was like big J journalism person. I think now the industry is going in such a direction where like you have to be you, there has to be a lot more authenticity in your work. And I think you can only do that if you feel comfortable that you're not going to be judged, you know, for letting your guard down. If you say something stupid or whatever, that people aren't going to assume it's because you don't actually know what you're talking about, but you just mispronounce the person's name or something like that. So, uh, I have found that over the years being in a lot of rooms, particularly with people who have, um, achieved a lot of things. I have sat in enough rooms having conversations with them that I got to a point to like, understand, oh, I actually do know what I'm talking about. I can have these conversations with them. And if the person at home assumes that I don't know what I'm talking about, that's their problem and not mine. And so I don't feel the need to prove myself every five seconds when I'm on air by like spouting out a bunch of unnecessary stats or like making points that feel unnecessary in conversations, which ultimately just make you look like you're a little insecure um, because ultimately you are. So... Um, a bunch of different things, but I would say that's the biggest one. And we have a, a guest now in my daughter. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this is perfect. I'm surprised my, my youngest hasn't come in yet. <laughs> I am um, sorry. I can't get through any, any shows here without this happening at some point. <laughs> Love it. Um, so with, for you with sports broadcasting, was it always sports broadcasting that you wanted to go into when you went into journalism? Was it, was the goal just journalism in general, or did you know that sports media was exactly what you wanted to do? I, uh, so when I went to college, I knew I wanted to do broadcast journalism, that that was going to be my major. I did not know if I wanted to like cover the white house and be Diane Sawyer, or if I wanted to be Hannah Storm and do sports. Like those were the two. Um, and then I took a poli sci class and I was like, well, I don't even know what they're talking about here. So, and then I signed up for like a sports internship and I loved that. And that led to a bunch of different things. So it felt like the choice was kind of made for me in that sense. Like one felt comfortable and like home and one very much did not. So, um, I, uh, yes. So sports was, sports was the thing I, I remember, when I was in high school, so I, I told you I didn't play sports, but I was always like, we had a, uh, that was a big part of my family. My dad always coached on my brother's teams and I would end up at the practices. And, um, and so I felt like I knew a lot about sports. Um, 
and I was really interested in sports and I would end up having these conversations about like the angels and, you know, we would check the box score from the night before this group of guys that were in my math class. And, um, and I remember the look on their face was always like, what, you know, when I would chime in with the levels of detail with regard to what they were talking about, they were always surprised. And I liked that. I liked feeling like I was proving somebody wrong in terms of what they expected from me and then being able to turn that on its head. I liked that feeling. And so I felt like that, that was one of the things that drew me to sports was the ability to just kind of like, you know, turn, turn a narrative on its head. Well, the rumor is that when it comes to fantasy leagues, you're pretty cutthroat out there. I mean, no, no prisoners, no nothing out there. And why would you be anything but in fantasy football? (laughs) Like, what's the point? So I, I feel that I need to get in one of these fantasy leagues with you. But first, I got to understand because I heard that you can be quite the trash talker as well. Oh, yeah, from yeah. Some other individuals out there. So kind of give me a little bit of trash talk. And you, I, I can kind of hear it in your voice when you were talking about those stats to those other guys. Where does that competitive edge come from? Because it seems like you've got that kind of amped up to the level 11 there. Huh. Yes. Uh, well, just I mean, so the thing about trash talking is just that, like, you have to never concede anything. There's not going to be any, you know, like, what is the point of doing fantasy football if you're going to be like, well, good luck this weekend, you know, (laughs) like what? So, like, I don't I don't understand. The whole point of it is to have fun and be competitive. And I I assume everybody always knows that, like, that's the you know, that's where I'm coming from. Not actually like suggesting that I'm better at fantasy (laughs) football than Michael Fabiano or any of the people that I'm playing against, but I'm going to play that role. I'm going to play that role to a T. (laughs) I don't know where the competitiveness comes from. I think it's like a, I'm, I'm, I think I said earlier when we were talking, I'm a recovering perfectionist. And I think that it kind of comes from that. Like if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it to the best way that I possibly can, unless it's something like running a 40 where I know, that I can't do it. (laughs) And then I'm totally fine looking like an idiot, you know, but if it's something where I feel like I'm somehow invested in the, the way that this looks like, you know, if football it's, there's credibility wrapped up in it a long time ago. Like I felt like I had to do well, right. You can't just be like, Oh, well, I'm bad at that. It's what I do for a living, but man, I just lose every week. Bummer. (laughs) Like that's dumb. (laughs) I would love to do like a, a a wrestling promo with you. I think you'd be you'd absolutely nail that kind of interview type yeah. thing. But in all your years of interviewing football players, baseball players, other members of the media, whatever that's looked like, I can't. I mean, you kind of mentioned Kevin Brown and being Kevin Brown. That doesn't really surprise oh, me sorry. in any way, shape, or form with him. Was there any? Was there ever a time you went into an interview kind of like, oh man, here we go, and then the person you interviewed actually surprised you? And you're like, wow, I did not know that. I, uh, this guy's awesome or this individual is awesome or kind of changed the way you thought about them after you talked to him. Um, uh, I don't know if I could think of a specific example right now of somebody who has, has been that way. Like I said, I have, so I have the worst memory, which is bad for interviews like this because I don't remember what happened last week. I've told people before, like there are very, very, very famous people that I'll be like, I can't remember if I've met that person or if I've just talked about that person so many times that I feel like I've met them. And people are like, I think you would remember meeting that person, right? And I'm like, no, 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 you have not met this brain. Like you could be the most famous person. And I would be like, I don't remember. Maybe we've met sometime before. So I, I, I'm jealous of, um, uh, Andrea Kramer is somebody that I've talked to a lot about our, you know, career paths. And there are specific things that I remember for one reason or another that are like weird, quirky things. And she remembers everything about everything. She's like, and then this one coach, I walked into the room and then I, you know, opened the door and I'm like, you should write all of the books because I could never write a book. I just remember like, basic things and then none of the details that go, you know, in between the two. So I don't remember anybody who completely there, there have been, there have been players who have come in to, you know, NFL network for one reason or another, they are a little bit guarded 
And then you start talking to them and you realize that maybe they were just nervous or something like that. Um, CJ Anderson was like that when he first came in um, the running back from the Broncos, he was a little bit standoffish. And I was like, Oh, he's that guy. You know, he's like the guy who thinks he's better than everybody else. And then he turned out to be completely the opposite and couldn't have been more lovely after the fact, but was a little bit like, you know, kind of kept to himself in the beginning. So I, I feel like this is, it's a really interesting career in terms of teaching you not to judge people just because you have so many conversations with so many people from different walks of life that I feel like this is, this is a career path that I'm so glad that I, um, that I have been on because uh, I recognize that like I grew up in orange County, California and you know, I was exposed to very specific things growing up. Right. Like, and then you go into sports and you meet people who are from all different backgrounds and all different like races and different types of upbringings. And some had money and some didn't have money. And you get into these conversations with them and you're, you know, the playing field is leveled in these uh, conversations and you just end up learning so much about people and the fact that like, we're all just people, you know what I mean? And even like the biggest stars have like things that are their things that are they're insecure about or whatever. And you just, it becomes really, really clear after a certain period of time that like, just, you know, we're all just people. And so, uh, it, I've felt very, very fortunate to have that type of perspective from just meeting so many different types of people. It's one of the things I love about sports and I think sports is so good for. Mm, I love that. So if you weren't doing sports broadcasting, and we've mm-hmm. nixed out, we've nixed out White House correspondent Girl. because poli sci is crazy. Yeah, we've nixed out writing a book. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> At what least the detailed book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I remember. <laughs> That's what my book title would have to be called. Yes. Like here are the five things that made an impression <laughs> for one reason or another. I don't know. That has what wheels. It would be. And there you go. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what I would. I don't know what I would be doing. Cause I'm at a point in my life too, where like, that's something that I'm thinking about, you know, like, I mean, you reach a certain age in broadcasting. The truth is like, as a female, like I've said for a million years, like there's a shelf life to being on camera, um, on television and you know, you, you're, you know, it in theory, and then you reach a certain age and you're like, Oh no, it's real. <laughs> like it's a hundred percent true. So, um, so I don't know. I've been thinking about that a lot, like what I would do if, if I wanted to have a second act or if I wanted to do something totally different, the thing is I love broadcasting. Like it's not even so much like I love the puzzle of putting together shows. I love the puzzle of being like, let's figure out how to make this work. You know, let's find out. Uh, it's one of the things I actually like about football. Like uh, when I love talking about the off season, like I love the roster building part of it. And it's because that's a puzzle. It's like, you know, what's, it's not so much, um, like the stats or anything like that. It's how do we make the stats make sense so that we can figure out what the best thing is or like fantasy football. How can we predict what's going to happen based on the information that we have available to us? It's all a big puzzle that I find very intriguing. Um, and I think that broadcasting is the same way. You know, how do you put together a show that works? Like what are the key components? You know, what do you feel like you have an eye for that other people don't have an eye for what stands out to you? Um, and so, uh, you know, trying to find something that jumps out at me that, that checks all of those boxes. I don't know what that is. (laughs) You mentioned being a woman in sports entertainment and sports media and, obviously that was kind of in the beginning. It was very difficult to kind of get your foot in the door and proving yourself, but now you've opened that door for so many other women to do the same thing. I mean, the opportunities now for women in sports media have grown exponentially. Thanks in part to women like yourselves. What has your journey though taught you about yourself so far? Have you, has it taught you like, Hey, I've got this extra gear. Like what, what, what didn't you know about yourself that now you're like, Oh wow. I had that in me. Um, I think it's, uh, I've always been, I've always been like confident, but, um, in specific situations, like, like a, like a fake it till you make it type thing. Like I always had that self-confidence, 
But I think that it, it took a while to get to a point, like I said, where I really felt like I deserved to be in the room, you know? And I think that that is something that, that I think a lot of women specifically deal with where I think, you know, there have been studies shown that women, when they apply for jobs, they have to feel like they have met every single criteria in order to even apply for the job. So they effectively feel like they have to be overqualified to feel like they are qualified. And, um, and I, I think it took me a long time to get to a point where I felt like, um, like, like I belonged, you know? And so, um, I think that that was, that was an interesting like pivot point in my career, uh, uh, watching my voice change at that point and feeling like I can speak up and I can say, this is how I think it should be, um, regardless of how it's received. Um, and to have confidence in the fact that I wasn't just, I didn't need to just be grateful that I had the opportunity because I think we're all grateful that we have the opportunity. Everybody knows that there's a long line of people right behind you that is more than happy to take your job because, you know, we work in sports. It's amazing, but you have to also, uh, get to a point where you realize that you, you bring value to the table too. And, uh, you know to, to lean into that. And then if the people don't see the value there, then that's fine that they don't see it, but that, you know, you should kind of, um, operate in that way, as opposed to just like constantly walking around and being like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but so I think that that was, there was a big change in me at a certain point. Um, when I realized that I, that I belonged there and I didn't have to constantly prove myself that I, I'd done that enough that I felt comfortable just kind of like being, I guess, without putting that type of pressure on myself every day. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of along the same lines, we've, we've seen a lot of um, relationships playing an important role of, you know, progressing yourself within the industry. Um, you know, are there, are there, you know, one or two people that um, you really respect and that have helped you along the way? Um, I think, more recently, I, I wish that I could say that I had like a bunch of mentors along the way. I don't necessarily know that I felt like I did. There were obviously, you know, people that you work with that make you better at your job. I never had like a specific person that I could call in the industry that I counted as a mentor. I do feel like more in the last few years specifically for me, there have been a lot more people that I feel like we've gone towards a trend of people being a little bit more transparent with one another. This is a business broadcasting is anyway, um, that is very cutthroat and it's very like each person for him or herself because there are so few jobs. And so you really do feel like you're in competition with everybody. And so it's hard to share information and the best way for everybody to succeed is to be more inclusive in terms of the information shared. Like, here's my experience, um, you know, finances. Uh, here is something that happened to me that I thought was a little bit of a tricky situation. Here's how I navigated it. Like something as simple as being a female as a reporter and trying to um, cultivate sources is really, really complicated because you're asking somebody for their phone number. And especially when you're younger and maybe before you're married and there's just a blatant sign like, hey, off the market, you're afraid that something's going to be misconstrued. And so I never really got to a point where I was very good at that. And I allowed the the, the tricky, weird situations that I ended up finding myself in um, that were unwanted that kind of pushed me away from going down that path. And luckily I ended up in a studio. And so I just didn't have to figure out how to get better at that. But I've had a lot of conversations in the last few years with people who do that at a very high level and started talking to them and realized they all feel the same way. And like, if we could share a script with one another, like, what do you say if the person makes it weird? You know, how do you ask for the phone number? Like, give me the words so that I can ask for the phone number in a way that's really obvious that I'm asking for, for the phone number for professional reasons and professional reasons only without sounding weird and making like I'm making assumptions about what they would think, you know? So I have found myself in conversations in the last few years with a lot more people where I feel like 
I am just going to be totally transparent about all of my experiences and my insecurities and my concerns. And I'm finding that that's coming back to me too. And I hope that that people are moving in a direction of being less competitive with one another and understanding that the more information we can all share with one another actually ends up helping us all. Right. And then whoever they're going to hire, they're going to hire anyway. You know, like yeah. you, we don't have to compete with each other and hoard all of our information and our little advantages that we think we have. Um, because ultimately that just helps them, right? Because yeah. no one has anything and any information to share. So I think that, um, I have found in the last few years, a lot of people around me kind of trying to like take back some power in that sense. And I've, I've, um, found myself with making better friendships in, in, in the business as a result. I mean, this whole conversation has been full of incredible advice. Uh, but if there's one last thing, one last piece of advice that you could give to those of us trying to make it within the sports and fantasy football industry, um, what would that be? Who? Um, I think. Oh God, I don't know what. Um, what would be the one thing that would stand out? Um. I think one of the things is kind of along the lines of what I was saying. I think that it, it can be uncomfortable sometimes to feel like you're putting yourself out there, but to try to put yourself out there as much as possible with your colleagues and not so much like your bosses. Like sometimes the, uh, the networking people network up, right? And I think that there's a lot of value to networking out and trying to build relationships with people who are at exactly the same level as you because you're going through a lot of the same experiences. And if you can help each other go through the same experiences and ask even specific questions like, Hey, I'm stuck on this piece that I'm writing. Like, do you have any work around? I've started reaching out to people. We live in a time right now with social media. It's so easy. Just you could send anybody a DM, you know, and so I send people DMs all the time that I don't know. And I'll say like, I really liked this article that, uh, that you wrote. Um, that is another thing that I do think is, is helpful to when you compliment people, compliment people specifically, you know, if there are things that you notice about people or about their work that you like, I think people always love hearing that. And if you compliment them in specific ways, it builds like a um, an understanding of, I think they feel more seen. Um, I know that for me, I respond to specific um, compliments as opposed to like just something that's really, really vague. Um and specifically the things that matter to me, right? Now it's going to be different for everybody, but like something will hit home and you're like, that's exactly what I was trying to put out there. And then you have an opening to create a relationship or a dialogue. Um, and so people who are looking for any kind of mentorship, I think there are more opportunities now than there have ever been because everyone is available to you, you know, in that sense, you could tweet anybody, you could DM anybody on Instagram, just shoot your shot and try and ask specific questions. That's another thing too, is people who ask like, how should I get into this industry? Or like, what advice do you have for me? Um, you know, it, it's so broad that it makes me do the work. And so uh, what I always tell people is if you hit me up with a very specific question that I can answer easily without really thinking that much about it, then I will answer. If I feel like, oh my God, I don't even know where you're coming from. How much do you already know? Like, do I have to tell the whole story about broadcasting's history in this? Like, then I feel like I don't have time to do that and I won't do it. So the easiest way to actually make those connections and, and start creating some sort of mentorship situation for you is to be very specific and, and respectful of the person's time in that sense. And that's how you get in the door. Perfect. Well, be, being respectful of your time, I mean, we're pushing here an hour for the whole show here, just over a little bit of an hour. Well, I mean, 15 uh, minutes of that was my daughter coming in after I hey, like threatened her life well, not to, but. Well, that, that brings up another part. I mean, we're giving advice here for fantasy football. We're giving advice for sports media, but what about parenting advice? What's that one go-to piece of parenting advice? Because I got I'm not I got the person kids. to ask, Matt. Obviously, I've got nothing. My children don't respect me. One of them does. My daughter, I literally like threatened several things. Like all of these things that you want will not happen if you come in there tonight. 
She's coming like three <laughs> times. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. You know what, what advice gets, do you have for yeah. me? It, it gets easier. I mean, by the time you get to where I'm at with eight kids, nine kids, I mean, they start to take care of themselves. You don't yeah. have eight kids. He does. It's you true. have eight <laughs> children? It's true. I, I, I had Schrager on the show here uh, er, last season, and he basically said that Philip Rivers was the American Matt Donnelly. I mean, we're right up there, me, <laughs> Philip Rivers, Antonio Cromartie. We're all battling neck and neck for the title of the most children. So, what? How? Like, well, I got to two, play- and I'm like, there's no chance. There's no chance we're going to three. I'm completely <laughs> overwhelmed. I'm distracted all the time. Like, how do you do it with eight? Well, is I mean, it eight you, or nine? You said eight or nine, like you didn't know, by the way. Well, see, I just it's picked a trick one. question. It's eight, but I got three grandkids now. And I mean, it's we've got foster kids that come into our care. So it could be that number on a weekend here. It could be 15 kids in this house. I mean, it, it's absolutely bonkers. And basically, it turns into Mad Max. I mean, you just hope for the best and hope you grab your own children when you go to the park because you don't want to walk away with extra kids. <laughs> I mean, the head count, the head count is an important <laughs> thing at this stage. <laughs> You could like field several sports teams. We can. We definitely have our own. Like, we go a full starting lineup and then a couple backups. I mean, we were working on that softball team because sometimes you need nine, sometimes you need ten. So we're we're pretty confident that we got that taken care of here now. But I mean, <laughs> parenting advice, I leave that to my wife because if it wasn't for her organization, mm-hmm. I have no clue what's going on here. But what I do know, I do know that everyone listening to the show needs to turn tune into the NFL Roads show each and every week and three times during the season because, hey, we're all here just trying to get some good information. You're not going to get much better information than you get on that NFL road show each and every week. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> so I'm going to leave with this one last thing, and let's just see here. I'm going to put it this way. I'm not above grabbing low-hanging fruit here but i hope you have all learned something tonight and become smarter and sharper fans yes i may have stole that from someone somewhere along the way (laughs) but you know what we will see you all next week and Lindsay, thank you for coming on the show tara we'll see you next time thank you for having me guys it's been a pleasure take care now